afternoon. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee, where we intend to do a final markup and vote on S-124. Um, I think uh, without, without any further delay, I will invite Betsy Ann to point us to the document that she'll be taking us through. All right, hello. Let me just quickly, I should have done this also. I will send a quick email to all of you containing a potential revised edited draft 4.1. This morning I sent the editors um, your 3.1 draft, the clean copy, and they uh, worked so hard to get it done quickly, get it done get that edited quickly, the 3.1 that we reviewed this morning. And then what I did in the meantime, uh, in between our break is make the few changes uh, that you had discussed um, this morning. So let me just, I emailed that to you and Andrea will be able to post it soon also. So um, people will be able to look at this draft 4.1 clean copy edited. It's an actual, strike all amendment form, except for right now, for the purposes of this discussion, I have highlighted the, I think, six changes that you discussed making to it this morning. So if it's okay to proceed, um, we've got- Lauren has a question. Yes, I just wanted to ask Andrea to post that on our legislative documents and handout page as quickly as she can. So because I otherwise I have to leave this screen and go over to you know I'm on my iPad, but I've got my laptop here. So if she could post it there, I can get. It. And I had just sent it to her before the meeting started, so that's why there's a a, a little lag in uh, posting it. It should be there now. Awesome, thank you, Andrea. Okay, I will refresh that page. Might just take a minute to go over the interwebs. Yeah, no, I'm... I think we oh, take a is. deep Yay. breath for a moment. And <laughs> given that Betsy Ann had about a five minute, well, 10 minute break, I guess, between appropriations and coming back to committee. Thank you. That's the last one. Four in the point. Okay, got it. Got Excellent. it. Excellent. Thank you, Andrea. Okay. So. This is 3.1, taking the 3.1 clean copy, which had incorporated all the annotated revisions and then adding to it the six changes that you discussed today. So Madam Chair, are you looking for just a super high level run through pointing out the changes? I believe so. All right, page one, changing the name of the Criminal Justice Training Council to Criminal Justice Council in order to reflect all of its duties and powers and then directing ledge council to change that name in uh, during the statutory revision process not having to come back to you with a technical corrections bill page two uh, updates to law enforcement applicants and adding in their current law duty uh, description to maintain statewide standards of officer professional conduct through their professional regulation duties and on page two, line 17, that they're also approving education programs. That's current. Moving on to page three, uh, the council membership uh, itself would not change as you reviewed it this morning. Um, that would mean keeping on there the commissioner of corrections, adding the commissioner of mental health as proposed by the Senate, and then scrolling over to page four, uh, starting on line 16, those seven new public members that would be appointed by the governor, no law enforcement connection, not be legislators or employed in the criminal justice system. At least one of them would be a mental health crisis worker, up page five, one, a member uh, who is an individual with an, a lived experience in mental health condition or psychiatric disability. And then two members chosen from among the Vermont chapters of the NAACP from nominations made to the governor from those chapters. Still on line 10, governor appointing the chair of the council from among those public members. On line 13, 
council members are entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses as permitted under 32 VSA 1010 from monies appropriated to the council. That means you get a per diem if you're not already getting paid to be there. Um, for example, our commissioners who serve on there, our AG, they already have state salaries. It's part of their state duties to serve on this council as this, uh, as you would require them to. Um, section five at the bottom of page five allows current members to continue to serve out their, the remainder of their terms if they're gonna be reappointed under the new membership. But here's your first change you discussed this morning on page six, line four, that the new members of the council have to be appointed by December one. Your prior draft said November 15th. Okay. So that's change one. Page six, section six, um, here's where the council is gonna have to adopt rules to identify and implement alternate routes to certification aside from what's provided the academy and then lower down, having to be required to offer courses in different areas of the state and strive to offer non-overnight courses whenever possible. And on page seven, um, there's that language on line 17, maintaining the as past Senate deadline that by July one of next year, a level two officer may be able to transition to level three by portfolio experiential learning or CLEP testing without having to restart the certification process. Um, House of Probes did discuss the concern that the council has um, in regard to not having, a, uh, that it, it stated it did not have the resources to meet this requirement, um, but so far no one has indicated they um, uh, requested a change to this date at this time. So right now it's leaving it at the July 1, 21 deadline. On page eight in section eight, here is uh, the report back by January 15th from the executive director of the council. Darn it, and how did I miss adjust? Oh no, I, I did fix it. Okay, criminal justice council. Okay, on line seven, um, their report back on how, they're, how things are going um, on restructuring its programs. And so the first uh, report back is about how what its plan is to replace some of its overnight training with non overnight training. And then the second change that you discussed uh, this morning was that they, they would have to specifically address in this report back any plans it has to offer training by remote means. Does that reflect what you wanted to do there. Okay, and they'll also be telling you on line 17 how it's going with. Um, that transition for level two to level three, um, how it's changing, it's restructuring its programs to handle that. So you will be hearing about that um, in January. So if you don't change that date now, potentially that'd be a date to change next session. But they do have the rule adoption deadline of July 1, 23 to, uh, um, to adopt the rules it's required to about uh, restructuring its programs. Page nine, section nine, there's that con, uh, council services being contingent on agency compliance with reporting requirements and other policies required by the council chapter. And we'll have to adopt procedures on how to uh, handle that new requirement. Section 10 is essentially a technical update to statute uh, to reflect current day realities, which is that one agency can provide training to other um, officers and those officers can get credit for that that goes toward their certification. Page 10, section 11, there's that uh, duty to contact a current agency uh, before a, a potential hiring agency is gonna hire the officer. They have to get the written disclosure from the current agency about the officer's performance there. It's a written disclosure, page 11, line 16, is the requirement you discussed this morning that they have to keep that disclosure confidential. And line 18 has the prohibition on a CBA um, between an agency and the bargaining unit uh, for officers employed by that agency um, from having a prohibition on the exchange of information between the employing agency and another agency about the officer's performance there. 
page 12, sec 12 has uh, transitional provisions on those new disclosure requirements. Um, A is saying that the requirement um, to disclose does not apply if there is a binding non-disclosure agreement prohibiting that disclosure that's in effect. Um, and then subsection B is providing that um, a CBA uh, that already prohibit that's in effect and that prohibits the exchange of information. You don't have to uh, break the contract of that those that CBA provision, but that requirement will apply upon the expiration or termination of that CBA and to any other CBA that takes effect on and after the effective date of that section. Section 13 at the bottom of page 12 in regard to the use of body cameras and a body camera policy and complying with one if your officers are going to be using a body cam. So A has a new subdivision one designation, but only the one designation is what's new. Um, that contains the language that um, starting on January 1, each agency that authorizes its officers to use body cams has to follow the model body camera policy that the council will establish. But as a transitional provision, because there will be officers that are using body cams, that includes the requirement for all DPS to use, uh, law enforcement officers to use body cams via Act 147 slash S219 and any other officers that might be using body cams, the new subdivision two requires uh, until that date in subdivision one, the January 1, 22, each agency that authorizes its officers to use body cams shall adopt, follow, and enforce the model body worn camera policy established by the LEAB pursuant to the 2016 Act. And each officer who uses a body cam needs to comply with that policy. So there will be a body cam policy in place. It's the LEABs, and that's what will um, control until the council um, model body camera policy is established and uh, officers and agencies have to start complying with that on January 1, 22. So that was another one of your changes you discussed today. Section 14 contains that prohibition on facial recognition technology unless the use would be permitted with respect to drones under 20 VSA 4622, which does authorize the use of facial recognition technology in limited circumstances. There's a definition of facial recognition technology on page 14. Then we get to section 15, which is about the council's duty to professionally regulate officers. And here, this section is discussing uh, when agencies have to report to the council alleged unprofessional conduct committed by an officer, specifically in regard to category B allegations on page 15. On line eight, agency has to report that when there's a credible complaint, not after an agency goes through a full investigative process. Page 16, line five is the requirement for the council to provide a copy of any investigative report it receives to the council advisory committee, which recommends appropriate action to take in regard to an officer who's the subject of that report. Then we get to section 16, which are the law enforcement recommendations. These are reports that will come back to you for the General Assembly to do further work in this area, as you may choose to do so in the next biennium. Uh, this provides that by January 15th, uh, entities have to report their progress on the following topics, including any recommendations for legislative action, with that exception that the Criminal Justice Council shall submit a verbal progress report to the GovOps committees by that date, January 15th, and any recommendations for legislative action on or before March 15th, 21. So you're giving them more time to uh, come back to you with recommendations for legislative action. Otherwise, everybody else has to do so by January 15th. You're gonna be getting on page 17 recommendations about officer qualifications from the LEAB and the council. You'll be getting recommendations on officer training from the council. Um, on page 18, I just made a terminology update um, to refer to people with a mental health condition or psychiatric disability to uh, more fully describe um, the people that experience those conditions. Uh, 
Um, just noting on line page 18, um, starting on line nine, um, there's talk about the restructuring of the council and just a reminder that you had eliminated the language about moving the police academy so that it no longer exists there. On line 18 for models of civilian oversight, you've got the AG coming back to you with recommendations after consulting with entities that include BLS's Center for Justice Reform. On page 19, line four, you'll also be getting recommendations back about reporting allegations of officer misconduct. And in number five, access to complaint information that'll be coming back to you from the Council Advisory Committee. And then body cameras, number six on line 18. Um, here, adding back in the language that the LEAB would be required to report any changes it deems necessary to its body, uh, model body camera policy that it established pursuant to the 2016 act that required it to do so since there will be the requirement from now until January 1, 2022 for officers to follow that policy. Scrolling on page 20, you'll be getting a report back on military equipment where the council will recommend a statewide policy on officers acquisition of it. All right, page 21, the bill starts to move into the topic of state data collection and analysis. There is the section 17 requirement for GAC uh, to consult with executive director of racial equity, social equity caucus and the CPO and accept recommendations from other entities in order to approve by that date population level indicators that demonstrate the quality of life for Vermonters who are black, indigenous or people of color as they relate to the current law population level outcomes. And once those are approved by the GAC, the CPO would be required to report on them in the state outcomes report. Section 18 is the amendment to the outcomes, uh, state outcomes report statute to provide on page 22 on line nine, the more uh, language about the intent and the purpose of the outcomes and indicators, um, which are that outcomes are intended to reflect the well-being of all Vermonters and indicators are intended to represent the experience of all Vermonters, including and especially Vermonters who are members of marginalized groups as they are the ones that are more likely to be the outliers on that indicator data. And you could just have that statute there for reference. If you get any questions about the current process for approving indicators, you can see that on page 23, um, starting on line six with that GAC authority to do so now. Page 23, line 17, section 19, there is the state granting authority contingent on compliance with the roadside stop data reporting requirements and now the death or serious bodily injury reporting requirements that are required um, when an officer is involved in a mental health crisis and death or serious bodily injury results. Um, the one correction or the one update to this language is on page 23, line 21 that you discussed earlier to strike local proceeding law enforcement agency. So it's clear that this applies to all agencies who um, would like to get a grant. Um, just a note on that this section has an effective date of January 1, 2021, because that was the effective date that you had in S219 for adding this language. So accordingly, that would also take effect. These amendments to that language would also take effect on January 1. Page 24, section 20 uh, is in regard to the VCIC requirement to have definitions that all officers must use when entering data into their agency system of records. Um, so it's VCIC on page 25, consulting with the Vermont Crime Research Group, statewide racial justice groups and statewide groups representing individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability in establishing and providing training on a uniform list of definitions to be used by agencies when they're entering in crime data into their system of records, which might be Valcourt or Spillman. And every officer would have to use those definitions when entering their data. 
Uh, then we get into the LEAB, repealing it from where it currently is in law, putting it where it's supposed to be, maintaining the Senate's proposed changes to the membership. There would be four new members added to it. Um, as discussed, there's no per diem or expense reimbursement authorized. Um, then the Senate, um, aside from changing the membership or in accordance with changing that membership, just updated the quorum requirements um, accordingly but you had not discussed making any changes to that. Page 28, section 23 is just um, a recodification directive. It's just saying that now any references to LEAB in 24 VSA 1939, where it currently lives, are gonna be deemed to be references to 20 VSA 1818, and uh, Ledge Council needs to revise accordingly um, any reference to the old location and statute. Uh, section 24 is requiring LEAB to include in its annual report um, uh, recommendations in, regarding the ways towns can increase access to law enforcement services. LEAB has to file an annual report. Then starting at the bottom of page 28, we get into the Department of Public Safety dispatch issue in section 25. So Let's scroll over to the relevant section, which is subsection I on page 29. As you discussed in your draft 3.1, you can see on page 29, starting on line 15, the elimination of the current law language that allows DPS to charge um, sufficient charges to recover the cost of their dispatching that they perform under contract and says dispatch functions that are fully funded under these contracts are authorized under the um, grant uh, statutory authority. But hold the thought on this because there's a also a related session law section right after, but just a reminder on page 30, that 1873 removal of commissioner, that's just been a dead law sitting in statute since 1979, since the Vermont Supreme Court said that this language was superseded because all governor appointees under the office of governor serve at the governor's pleasure. So this language has been outdated pursuant to the Vermont Supreme Court case law. The statute said that um, uh, Commissioner of Public Safety can only be removed after a hearing and only for cause. It is a really fun case to read. Um, if you ever want to read it, it, basically the governor tried to use the new authority to remove uh, the commissioner at his pleasure. And then the person just showed up the next day saying, hey, I get to keep, continue to serve. Um, but anyway, it's just a technical correction because it's been dead law. We get to section 26 on page 31, line 16. Um, and this is in regard to that dispatch uh, fee structure authority. So this new language um, is updating what you had earlier today. In your draft 3.1, um, we had the prior understanding that DPS was in some cases charging um, for dispatch. Nolan confirmed with DPS that's not happening. DPS has these contractual arrangements, but it's not charging for them. What it was planning to do was set charges that they were going to start charging municipalities. Well, this language would say instead that in accordance with the amendments to 20 VSA 1871 sub I that we reviewed up above, which eliminated that charging authority from law DPS shall not charge fees in any contractual arrangements it enters into to perform dispatching functions for state, municipal, or other emergency services until the General Assembly establishes in law a dispatch fee structure for those charges. So it is clear that DPS cannot charge for the dispatch functions it performs until General Assembly establishes a fee structure. Page so can I um, can I just flag this here so that I don't lose sight of this after we finish and vote on this? Um, I just want to be sure that we get a heads up to the chair of the Ways and Means Committee about this. I believe that the language we've put in here, because it doesn't change or establish a fee, um, shouldn't require the bill to go to Ways and Means. Um, but since we have had a few snags along that line uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'd, I'd feel better if we <laughs> sent her this particular section and, and uh, just gave her a heads up to 
ask for it if she feels like she needs it, but I don't believe that she will. And it's at least possible it's going to get automatically referred uh, by rule just because even though DPS is not charging by statutory authority it currently has it could so it would just depend um, whether it has to go there or not but good I good call just to make the chair aware of that. On page 32, line three, um, here's the language you already reviewed about DPS um, having a process to propose to the General Assembly a fee structure. It would say that by March 15th of the next year, they have to hold at least three public hearings and consult with the LCT, the EMS Advisory Committee, the Police Chiefs Association, State Firefighters Association, and local emergency medical services, police and fire agencies in order to report by that date to House GovOps, House Ways and Means, Senate GovOps, Senate Finance, the department's recommendations for an equitable dispatch fee structure for DPS to charge for dispatching emergency medical service, police and fire services, and potential funding mechanisms for those charges that do not rely on property taxes. And if the department decides to overrule substantial arguments and considerations raised against the fee structure or potential funding mechanisms it ultimately recommends, DPS has to include in its report a description of those arguments and considerations and the reasons for the department's decision to overrule. Okay. Then we get into the EMS part of the bill on page 33. What's going on here is a substitution of Department of Health for State Board of Health and establishing EMS districts and um, issuing ambulance licenses. I'm gonna keep scrolling. Page 35, there's that uh, language requirement about ambulance licenses can only be issued if it's going to be provided, if those services will be provided in a non-discriminatory manner, doesn't discriminate on the basis of income, funding source, or severity of health needs in order to ensure access to ambulance services within the licensee service area. And Department of Health would be required to adopt rules um, in order to administer that new uh, qualification. Scrolling um, bottom of that page 35, it's the Department of Health that issues ambulance licenses, not the state board. Page 36, section 28 is a requirement for the HRAP, the Health Resources Allocation Plan to address EMS resources and needs that are identified by the EMS Advisory Committee, which appears later in the bill. I'll just pause here, Madam Chair. I remember you uh, had mentioned that House Health Care was gonna be reviewing uh, the EMS or at least partially this language. So just putting it back on the radar in case they need further information. Um, yeah, I did make the chair of House Healthcare aware of this um, uh, again last night in case he had any concerns. And, um, and I had told him at that point that we were intending to vote it out in our 830 committee meeting. So um, I'm going to take that as uh, he's okay with the language the way it is, but I suppose if there was some earth shattering change that needed to be made, they could offer it as a floor amendment. Okay. Page 38, line 10, we get into the uh, language to just make it clear in the statute that you still have to be affiliated with an affiliated agency in order to be EMS personnel. Um, just due to some of the removal of the credentialing requirements there. Uh, it, it's better to, from the feedback from DOH, it's better to make clear that affiliation is still required, even though uh, credentialing is not required. But you still have to be affiliated. Page 39, starting on line eight, is the requirement for Department of Health to establish at least three levels of EMS instructors and the education required for each. Right now there's only one. Page 40, uh, we get into that uh, alternative for psychomotor skills testing, the hands-on testing of your qualifications to be um, EMS personnel. Um, the national crediting entity, that NREMT, 
requires its own psychomotor skills testing for the higher license types, the advanced EMTs and the paramedics, but it does allow flexibility for testing the psychomotor skills for the lower license types. And so this would allow um, psychomotor skills testing for EMRs and EMTs to be accomplished either by the demonstration of those skills competencies as part of their education as approved by the Department of Health or by the NREMT psychomotor exam. And we'll just say hands-on. Uh, we just got more updates about the affiliation requirement on page 41. Uh, top of page 42 is a requirement for Department of Health to establish by rule an entry-level certification for Vermont EMS first responders. So this would be the lowest level authority to be EMS personnel, um, but it, it uh, could help get more people into um, providing EMS services. Page 42, line five is eliminating an outdated statute that doesn't need to address a transitional provision from certification to licensure that happened um, multiple years ago. Line 13 is the sunset review where DOH would have to uh, at least once every five years do an ongoing review of the continuing competency requirements um, that any EMS personnel um, <clears throat> professional has to achieve in order to renew his or her license. And it's modeled off your S-233 uniform licensing bill. Um, and it contains similar language, for example, on page 43, where the department has to amend its rules or propose necessary statutory amendments in order to revise the continuing competency requirements that are not necessary to protect the public. On line 10, we've got the EMS Advisory Committee and adding the new EMS Education Council. Um, top of page 44, the EMS Advisory Committee would need to include in its annual report the mutual aid calls that are going to outside of the area that uh, EMS personnel have to respond to. And on line six, uh, that new requirement for the EMS Advisory Council to identify EMS resources and needs in the EMS districts and provide that information to the Green Mountain Care Board so that they can include it in their periodic revisions to the HRAP, the Health Resource Allocation Plan, which is addressed earlier in the bill. On line 11 is that EMS Education Council, which would be new, and it would be established from among the current EMS Advisory Committee. Um, this new Education Council uh, can sponsor training and education programs that are required for licensure in accordance with the Department of Health required standards for training and education, and then also provide advice to DOH regarding the standards for emergency medical personnel licensure and any recommendations for changes to those standards. Page 45, um, there's just an update to the statute that provides to whom EMS training uh, funding can go, and it's adding in the new certified Vermont EMS first responder certification that would be added by this bill, and then also the current law licensed EMRs, emergency medical responders, so that they could also have access to that funding. Page 46 contains the transitional provisions for these EMS uh, portions of the bill. The rule adoption deadline is July 1, unless LCAR extends it. The ambulance license service non dis Ambulance service license non-discriminatory requirement begins on July 1, or by the date DOH adopts the rules to administer that, whichever is later, because they could get an extension to adopt those rules. Um, C is that language to transition uh, an instructor that's currently licensed. There's one instructor uh, license level now, and this would say that the person gets tran uh, transitioned into the new level and according to the three that will be um, created pursuant to this bill. So you go into the license level that's consistent with your scope of practice um, from among the three license levels. D on line 18 is the requirement to establish that new um, Vermont EMS first responder certification by July 1 of next year. And then E on page 47, line three, is the 
first sunset uh, review that they'll have to do. Um, it would need to be in conjunction with the rulemaking required by this act. So as they're looking at these rules, they'll take a look at those continuing competency requirements, see if any of them need to change because they're not necessary to protect the public. And then finally, we've got public safety planning with your new language um, about regional planning commissions creating an inventory for its towns of each towns. Uh, public safety resources that are available to them um, and how those resources can be shared on a, uh, so towns can better understand how those resources can be shared on a regional basis. You discussed bumping up the deadline to be July 1, 22. Um, and their inventory would have to address mutual aid agreements that any towns have and any public safety plans that they have. And when we're talking about public safety resources, it's referring to law enforcement, fire, and EMS, and dispatch. Finally, your effective dates. Overall, the bill will take effect on October 1, except that new council membership would take effect on December 1, in accordance with the deadline to make those appointments by December 1. And that uh, language regarding the contingency for state grant for law enforcement um, needing to be contingent on complying with data collection that takes effect on January 1 as your language did for um, S219. Excellent, thank you. So there we have it committee. We have a 48 page bill, uh, Jim Harrison. I was, thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering if maybe Ledge Council could go through the bill just one more time. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. As always, good job, Betsy Ann. You're very, um, I, I gotta learn to talk quicker so I could, uh, you would leave me in the dust. Um, anyhow, um, as with any bill, there are certainly parts that I think are very positive and parts that I might take issue with. Um, and I'd really like to support this bill, um, but but I have a, an exception and I will just, not to, book, to belabor the point, but I would throw it out one more time. Um, and that is allowing the governor to appoint the chair of that, um, pretty dramatically expanded criminal justice council. Um, I, I worry about putting a brand new person in uh, from the get-go and having um, all these requirements and studies and reports and policies thrown at them. Um, I just think um, we're setting ourselves up for a less than perfect outcome um, and I, uh, I, I would encourage the committee to consider making that change. And if you would indulge me, then I uh, would like to be able to support the bill. We can certainly have that conversation one last time. I appreciate that that is a sticking point for you, Jim. And, um, and I understand that it is, uh, it is a, a bit of a change, um, but we did we did cross this bridge a few times earlier today. Um, Warren. I was persuaded by Hal's comments earlier today that really the chair doesn't have to be the expert in all things. The, the job of the chair is to be an excellent facilitator of the meeting and to draw other people into the conversation. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see the necessity of having great experience at the head of the table. They just have to be fair and impartial and run a good meeting. So I, I would support leaving it as it is. Although I understand Jim's concern, I really do. And I wouldn't be afraid of having the governor make the appointment, but I like the language as we have it. That's, that's all I got. 
Thanks, Warren. Any other committee discussion on that point before we move to a motion? JP. I would uh, just re renew my preference as, uh, from my set a couple of times already. I pre prefer to have the chair elected from the uh, council members themselves. Um, if that's not to be the case, then I guess my my second choice would be to, to have the governor appoint, but from have the ability to appoint a chair from all members of the council. Uh, again, that's just my, my opinion and my belief and I'm very strong on that, but thank you. Other committee discussion? All right, I would, um, at this point, I guess I would entertain a motion to move this bill out of committee. John Gannon. I move to approve um, draft 4.1 of S124. Um, I'll give Marsha a moment to pull out her roll call sheet. Any other committee discussion before we move to a vote? All right, Marsha, when you're ready. I am ready, Madam Chair. Gannon. Yes. Kitz Miller. Yes. Rowicki. Yes. Leclerc. No. Harrison. No. Gardner. Yes. Classic. No. Cooper. Yes. Brownell. Yes. Colston. Yes. And Copeland Hansis. Yes. So the vote is eight three zero. Thank you, committee, for a marathon of um, work and productivity on the bill. And um, and I am so thankful to all of you for uh, your engagement in this and for the work that uh, that you did to improve all aspects of the bill, um, even if in the end uh, there was a sticking point that kept you from being able to support it. Um, and thank you, Betsy Ann and um, and Nolan for your help with uh, with everything uh, to, on this bill. Um, Betsy Ann has probably got the bill memorized at this point because we've made her go through it so many times for, <laughs> for us. Um, but thank you, Betsy Ann, for your great work on this. Uh, Jim. Thank you. I, if she had gone through it one more time, maybe I would have seen the light. <laughs> um, just a, a procedural question, Madam Chair. Um, does this mean we get tomorrow morning off? Yes, it does. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it means that you don't have to report to committee at 8.30. You can um, report to the floor, I believe, at 10. Unless there's something else that you'd like to take up tomorrow morning, which, you know, this uh, is a hardworking committee. There's always next week if we have other things we want to take up. Hey, Madam yeah, Chair, I, I have a question. Um, if the member from Chittenden would like to go through the bill one more time, mm -hmm. maybe he could be one of the presenters and could get a better understanding that way. <laughs> and do lots of extra homework. Evidently he needs it. Well, I think he is aspiring to be as smooth as uh, legislative council is on um, explaining the various sections of a bill. Smooth and thorough, I should say. He, he's got a lot of work to do to be able to that do that. That is a very, very high bar for him, yes. 
All right, so um, a couple other logistics. I believe that this is coming up on the floor on Tuesday at this point. Um, it'll go over to appropriations. Um, they will, they have taken some testimony. They'll let us know if they need us back. Um, so it'll be up during the week next week. Um, however, I do want to just make note to the committee so that we can all manage our expectations, myself included, um, that in the with the understanding that the legislature is moving to final adjournment on this uh, 2020 legislative session uh, by next Friday. Um, in the event that there was some significant compromise that needed to be make, made in order for the Senate to be able to concur with our proposal of amendment, um, they may bring that back to us um, in the form of a, an amendment that we might be asked to make in a friendly nature to our own bill on the floor of the house. So I, I just wanna make note of that, that we are going to make sure that the Senate has had a chance to look at it and can live with the changes that we've made in, um, in this short time frame. Well, Madam Speaker, we'd be very open to some significant amendments on this legislation. <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> There might be other people, like maybe two other people who agree with you on that one. Um, so this afternoon is gonna be a, a bit of a marathon floor session. Um, John Gannon, are you ready? Do you need us to send you off with some really good wishes for hopefully what is your final report of the cannabis bill? I, I truly hope it is my final report of the cannabis bill. I mean, oh, and I hope, uh, all the members of the committee can support um, the conference committee report. Um, it, was, it was great to work with Rob and Janet um, uh, and the senators weren't that hard to deal with. So, um, though it took a long time to get where we ended up, um, it, it, it'll be interesting how it goes on the floor, but. Um, just, just make sure you mentioned the hardworking and talented government operations committee. That will do the trick every time. <laughs> Well, I just want to say thank you to you, John, um, and to Rob as well for uh, for for putting in what is now uh, going on a year and a half of uh, work and thought and preparation into into this day. And uh, we certainly hope that it goes well for you, so that um, this gift that keeps on giving can go be somebody else's baby. <laughs> I have to tell you, Madam Chair, I wasn't a user before, but I'm highly considering it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are certain things that 2020 is uh, is um, is bringing us that are challenging, and this one has been a continuous challenge. So. Thank you, John, for your good work. And uh, we'll be right there behind you on the floor this afternoon. Hopefully it'll be a speedy report, minimal uh, interrogation and a quick vote. I, I hope so. It is a fairly speedy report. Um, so I will not keep it too long. Um, Great. We're not gonna go through the 105 pages section by section. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nelson says thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, so thank you all, committee, for your great work. Um, and we will not have committee tomorrow so that we can um, do our work on the floor of the house and then uh, maybe get some fresh air and exercise and sunshine if the haze has gone away. Um, any other questions or comment? Oh, I should um, I should tell you that Marsha and I are going to report this bill. Um, so I will uh, I will get version 4.1 to the House Clerk's office um, in order to make that uh, that bill go on its merry way in a timely manner, so that we can adjourn and get out of here. So thank you, Marsha, in advance for uh, for helping me with that project. Absolutely. All right. If that is all, Jim, your hand is still up, but I'm assuming that you're uh, that that's just from before. Great. All Sorry. right.
see you all on the floor in 40 minutes or so.